My name is Josh. I serve on the production team and I'm a part of Renaissance. All right, our teaching text for today is John 20, 24 through 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. I want to talk today about doubt and faith. This is what Os Guinness says about wrestling with this passage. There are two equal and opposite errors into which Christians are inclined to fall when thinking about doubt. On the one hand, those who are theologically liberal tend to be too soft on doubt, lionizing such notions as ambiguity and uncertainty and verging on a spiritual permissiveness that becomes a slipway to unbelief. On the other hand, those who are theologically conservative tend to be too hard on doubt, demonizing the dire consequences of unresolved doubt and verging on a spiritual perfectionism that leaves doubters in such a state of guilt or despair that they dare not acknowledge their doubts to others or even to themselves. Now, this passage is included for a reason because God wanted us to know what to do with our doubts. And our mentor on doubt and faith today is going to be the person of Thomas. So I want to do, it's a very simple talk today. I want to talk about what doubt is and how to deal with it. I want to talk what, about what faith is and how to cultivate it. And then I want to talk to you about wherever you are, how to take the next step in responding to doubt and faith. So let's jump in doubt. Here's what I want to start off by saying. Doubt is inevitable. You're, if you haven't doubted yet, you've got a future date with doubt. It's a blind date. It's a setup. It's required. Doubt is in your future. Look what happens to Thomas here. It says, now Thomas, known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. I, I have such deep empathy for Thomas in this passage. If maybe you've been in one of these environments. You look around the room and everybody's got their hands raised. They're speaking in tongues softly with a melodic tone. There's tears on their cheeks. They're swaying. And you're just sitting here thinking, I am not feeling any of this at all. It feels like everybody else has access to some divine truth or some kind of spiritual encounter. And you're not getting any of it. All of us at some point will be left out or feel left out spiritually based on the experiences we perceive others to be having. And it's painful when it happens. On top of that, we live in a culture of doubt. This culture, you know, is sociologically called uh, secularism. But it is designed to eliminate faith or minimize faith from our public consciousness. I want you to, it's, it's hard, we live in a culture today where it is hard to believe. The cultural mechanisms do not facilitate an attention span that drifts towards the things of faith. If they do happen to be about faith, it's normally faith and a culture war. It's faith and an issue. It's faith and a politician. It's faith and a controversy. The culture is not up there saying, hey, folks, it's a busy, busy week for everybody. I want to make sure you're taking care of your souls. So we're going to have a national holiday. It's called Developing Your Interior Life. Just want to make sure you can just feed yourself on God's Word and get some silence and solitude. and Just basically abide so you can bear fruit. That doesn't exist in our world today. Other times of history that weren't secular, it was hard to doubt. 
You go back in time several hundred years, every reference point, art, philosophy, culture, government, whatever, all of it ran through the church or a, a faith framework. And so we just don't live in a world that facilitates a sense of the sacred, particularly a sense of Christian sacredness. But I think more than anything, when we tend to doubt, it's not that larger cultural angst we feel. It's our personal doubt. Sometimes we have a naive faith. And it's not childlike, it's childish. We just take all of our longings and hopes and project them onto God that He'll get us through our current existential crisis. And God is open to doing that because He's kind. But that's not the same thing as a covenant relationship and profound faith. And so sometimes when God doesn't do what we want, it can be very challenging. Orberg says this, scratch the surface of any cynic and you'll find a wounded idealist underneath. It's someone who had taken all of their stuff and projected it onto God, and when it wasn't matched up, they can become cynical. A lot of folks, I think the doubt is basically from the Bible. You're like, you're telling me to read the Bible to build my faith. I read the Bible and it shakes my faith. Some pretty gnarly stuff in the Old Testament, if we're honest. Sometimes it's other religions. We see people who are so sincere. They're better at Christianity than most Christians, and they don't even believe in Christ. And it just shakes us. How can a God exclude people of this kind of sincerity? Sometimes it's oppression, but a lot of times it's just it's our own personal circumstances. I thought I'd be married by now. I thought my child would get well. I thought my parents' marriage would make it. I thought my marriage would make it. Our very lives and expectations are shaken by doubt. It's, it's hard to deal with these things. You're like, no, no, I'm strong. I'll never wrestle with that. Your boy, John the Baptist, had a crisis of doubt. He's raised with a profound sense of call. He knows he's chosen by God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. And yet, after faithfully serving Jesus as a forerunner, he ends up in prison for being obedient. And he sends, in a crisis of doubt, in a crisis of faith, sends an SOS to Jesus. Jesus, are you the one? Now, he knows he's the one. He's baptized him as the one. He's seen and declared to everyone, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he knows theologically, he knows positionally, this is who Jesus is. But circumstantially, he's like, I appreciate you being the Messiah of Israel. I want to know about the prison situation I'm facing right now. He sends a message to Jesus and Jesus comes back and says, don't worry. If you just pray and worship, the prison walls will shake and you're going to get out. No, Jesus says, tell him this. Everybody else is going to get deliverance, but he won't. And he dies by having his head cut off because a young woman dances in a provocative way and it overthrows the power dynamics of the empire. That's a crisis of faith. And then Jesus actually says there's been nobody like him. But his story doesn't end how he wants. And I think that's a lot of the times what it is we wrestle with. Point two, you must wrestle with the doubt that comes your way. Look at what Thomas says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Here's what Thomas is saying. I believed in Jesus enough to drop everything and follow him. I believe that Jesus died. But if you want to give me a script for which there is no plausibility structure for my future, and you want me to go all in, I'm going to need some proof on that. He doesn't have a grid of how to move forward based on this new reality that he is experiencing. So he's, he's got to wrestle with it. Christians uh, or sociologists have a little term. It's called spiritual bypassing. It's actually a term originally from a Buddhist, a Buddhist scholar. And spiritual bypassing basically says this. Wow, God's so good. I don't need to worry about how I was raised as a child. God will fix everything family of origins, nothing compared to the power of the Holy Ghost. My faith can handle anything because I've got the promises of God's Word. Therefore, I don't need to deal with the abuse that I was handled and all of the drama of my life. Everything's good. 
I've got these horrific gnawing doubts that this whole thing's a joke, but it doesn't matter as long as I show up on Sundays. I can get a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost and things will be fine. And that stuff is fine for now. But that, stuff, that stuff's going to come for you. It's going to get you. We don't operate out of what we wish. We operate out of what we are. And those crises reveal what's in us, not what we wish was in us. And then that stuff's going to come out. Eugene Peterson says this, the reason many of us do not ardently believe in the gospel is that we have never given it a rigorous testing, thrown our hard questions at it, faced it with our most prickly doubts. So this, this is a painful process and it can be very, very disorienting. The Philippians 2 says that we're to work out, not work for, work out, our salvation with fear and trembling. I'm telling you, when you get into one of these moments, the fear fear will be a part of the equation and trembling will be a part of the equation. If it's going to be real, if it's going to be deep, if it's going to be robust, you will have to wrestle through it. You cannot go around it. There is no road to spiritual maturity that does not walk straight through doubt. If you get past it due to nice circumstances, you're going to hit a wall and do a tour of duty. It may not feel like you're going to do a giant loop through your life and be right back at the same stuff you have not resolved. It's encouraging so far, this talk. Next part. Here's what I want you to know. Doubts are part of the human condition. Everybody doubts. There's not something wrong with you if you doubt. Let me tell you right now, atheists doubt every day. It's a wonderful documentary. It's called Collision. I was here uh, several years back. uh, There was a sort of like a rise of new atheism. And uh, there was this big push. There was a book called uh, The God Delusion. There was another book called God is Not Great. And Christopher Hitchens, an amazing public debater. I mean, he was so good. He just had like this British swagger, always expensive scotch, and an arrogant, defiant spirit, and a profound condescension for people who took their faith seriously. It was awesome to watch. And uh, he would do debates here in New York. And uh, so they made a documentary of Christians debating him. And uh, he always respected people who believed the craziest stuff, a.k.a. biblical faith. He didn't want to deal with liberals or progressives who were making excuses and having war. He loved a fundamentalist. And uh, so they made this documentary where he was, he's traveling around debating. The documentary is called Collision. And about the closing of it, so fascinating. It's the final scene of the documentary. And the scholar sort of asked him, like, hey, are there any of these arguments that you as an atheist, like, that they're real to you. And he said, you know, the fine-tuning argument that if our planet was, you know, 100 miles this way or that way, life on Earth wouldn't exist. There'd be no such thing as human history, human beings, anything. And it does have the appearance that all of life is strategically designed in such a way that we get, I don't know, this. He says, it doesn't prove in Jesus, doesn't prove there's a creator, but gee, there's something to it you have to wrestle with. And it's just a beautiful scene of an atheist doubting his atheism. Just an amazing documentary. And I was just sitting there thinking, look at this true non-believer being tempted by faith. Look, 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 we don't have all the data. And anybody who says we does is lying. We just faced a virus we didn't have a vaccine for. We had to make one. We had to get one. We are this far into human history. All the wars, all the poetry, all the politics, all the nations rising and falling, and we with all our technology still bump into something like, oh gosh, we need to fix this now because we don't have something for it. Amazing how little data we have about many things. So my point is, you've got to have a kind of humility in this. Everybody is groping their way towards the light, believer and unbeliever alike. George MacDonald said this, doubts are messengers of the living one to the honest. And it's just God going, you sure? Let me just pop this in here, see what you really believe. Doubt is going to be a part of your story at some point. 
And we, we, can't, we can't fake it out. We can't whip it up. Let me tell you something right now. There's no pep talk to get you through the dark night of the soul. And I love pep talks. I, give, I have 10 minutes in my morning schedule to pep talk myself with the gospel. That's not going to do it. You've got to wrestle with this stuff. It's real. It's coming. And this is what's so encouraging to me. The Bible, right towards the end, when Jesus is alive from the dead, gives us permission to see it and to speak to it and experience and wrestle with it. That was doubt. Let's talk about faith. There's a classic painting, Caravaggio is the Downing of St. Thomas, and you've seen this. Whenever you think of art and you think of Thomas, you think of this image here. So a little visio uh, divina, okay? But so let me just say, say this. Um, number one, the first thing you notice is like, Thomas is too old, okay? This is just like, this is just a model, and uh, Thomas is definitely younger than this, unless his doubt really did a number on him, okay? <laughs> but that's quite strong. But here's the thing. I was looking at this picture, and here's what stood out to me. I'd never noticed this before. Look at their foreheads. You see, they're all, they're, they're intense. They are leaning in. Every one of them, their forehead is struggling to behold. Is this real? Is this happening? What is going on here? They are wrestling with faith in the presence of doubt. Gregory the Great says this, it was not an accident that the particular disciple was not present. The divine mercy ordained that a doubting disciple should, by feeling in his master the wounds of the flesh, heal in us the wounds of unbelief. The unbelief of Thomas is more profitable to our faith than the belief of the other disciples. For the touch by which he is brought to believe confirms our minds in belief beyond all question. What a gift. God's included this part of the story to show us how to overcome our doubt. Now, when we're talking about faith, I think it's important that we clarify what we mean by faith. Faith must be clarified. So I want to start by saying this. Everybody has faith. Everybody is trusting in something. My wife was sick recently, and she, she said, hey, can you run down to the pharmacy and get me some medicine? And um, my wife has a little phrase that if she says it, I am powerless. It's like a spell. I'll do whatever she says. It'll be two o'clock in the morning. I'll be asleep, about to get up, a couple of hours. And uh, she'll say, I believe in you. <laughs> if my wife says, I believe in you, she believes in me. I've got to do it. She believes. My wife's like, I believe in you. Can you go get my medicine? So here's the thing. I, lo I love my wife. I'll do anything for my wife. But I just, just trusted that there was some body of knowledge in history that determined that this sort of illness required this sort of treatment. I didn't personally say, first, I'd just like to talk to the doctor. just want to double check that uh, we're evaluating the same symptoms. Do you have his number? Let me just get started. No, I just was like, okay, no worries. I go to a pharmacy. I don't see the pills. I'm like, excuse me, sir, can you show me the buckets that you got those from just in case there's a mix-up? I've been reading quite a few accounts. There's been... No, I, I give personal information to the people and then I pay them for this uncertainty. I'm like, thank you. I have no idea what's about to take place. Take my money. Let me give this to the woman I love. And then I just say, make sure you take these. The level of faith required to navigate a typical day is very high. And so I, I want to say that we are exercising faith all the time. So the question we have to ask ourselves, why would we exercise faith in Jesus? It's like, well, there's like scientific literature. There's a history of medicine. We know this. Why Jesus? John Ortberg has this little line that I like. He says this, faith is an exercise in strategic uncertainty. So there's, it's, there's uncertainty in all of our lives, but Christians are strategically saying that we should put our faith in the person of Jesus. Now, this is the whole point of John's gospel. Gary Burge, in his commentary on John, says this, it is striking that John never uses the noun faith in his gospel. Yet the verb to believe appears almost 100 times. 
The Synoptic Gospels, that's the other Gospels, together use this verb only about 35 times, and Paul uses it about 100 times in all of his writings combined. Listen, John's interest is to underscore the act of believing as opposed to the content of faith. More than anywhere else in the New Testament, John's Gospel follows this verb with a preposition into, which demands not only that we simply believe that we place our faith into someone, in most instances, it is into Jesus. And so John's whole argument, and this is why, I, you, know, you know, I've been going crazy on the Gospel of John. Um, if you're here and you have not been in church for a long time and you are like inching your way back towards faith, we've got these for you. This is the, a, like a journaling version of the Gospel of John. And it's got like the, the Scriptures, but then it's like, your thoughts that you're wrestling with in the Scriptures. These are free. Just grab one on the way out. And I would just say to you, nobody can talk you into believing in Jesus because someone else will be able to talk you out of believing in Jesus. But if you honestly read John's Gospel and just sit with it and ask, God, show me who Jesus is. Jesus, speak to me. I think you'll be just remarkably struck with who the person of Jesus and why is worthy of our faith. John's going to do several things in this Gospel. Number one, he's going to give you He's going to show you what Jesus is capable of, capable of doing. He's going to show you his power over nature, over sin, over human systems, over disease, over loneliness. It's remarkable. He's going to talk about the signs Jesus gave, where Jesus is like pointing to something, seven signs. And so if you listen to Jesus and you follow what Jesus is looking at, you're going to find what Jesus is offering. So I'd encourage you, like, take one of those. It's our gift to you and wrestle with it deeply. And that's important because John's not saying, I want you to have a Christian worldview. My goal is that you will fall within the large orthodox creeds that will come at some point in the radical future here. I want to make sure that uh, you believe all of the scriptures. He's not just in a war for theology. He's in a war of relationship that you would know the person of Jesus himself. Faith is in Christ. In a 1869, Charles Blondin, you may have heard of him, first person to ever cross Niagara Falls on a tight rope. Here's a picture of it. Yeah. Walks 25,000 people show up to see this. Okay? People love a possible horrific uh, event, don't they? If that, I mean, it, it, they, 25,000 people show up. The crowd loves it. Okay, so he's like, well, I did that. What else can I do? He brings a mini kitchen next into the middle of the, the tightrope and cooks an omelet, eats it, and then goes back. And people are just like, you're the man. You know, it's incredible. <laughs> then he gets a wheelbarrow with 350 pounds of concrete in it, wheels it across. And everyone's just like, what can't you do? So he's just proved he can walk it, he can cook on it, he can do a wheelbarrow on it with 350 pounds, and he comes back to the shore and everyone's like, this is amazing, you're not a man, you're a god. I mean, it's just a wild scene. And he says, how many of you think that I could carry 200 pounds across? And everyone's like, of course you can. Are there any 200 pound people in the room? Oh, Oh, oh. Is there anyone willing to get in the wheelbarrow? No. No. Listen, John's whole gospel is not so you can go, wow, do the omelet thing again, Jesus. This is not the point. Jesus showed up to get you into the wheelbarrow from death to life. And this is why faith is important because the faith experience is very different than the faith of theology and worldview. When you're in the wheelbarrow, you're going to want to vomit a little bit. When you're in the wheelbarrow, you may wet yourself. When you're in the wheelbarrow, you may think, this is the end of what am I doing? That's what faith is like. So the idea of faith, oh, it would be amazing if Jesus would die for my sins. It would be amazing if I could live by faith and not by sight. The miracle comes after you want to throw up in the middle of the wheelbarrow, not on the shore clapping from a distance. So that's why we've got to have mercy 
with people's experience of faith because living it can be perilous, heartbreaking. But it makes it even worse. Imagine the person walking across the wheelbarrow is being shot down by the Taliban in a giant war. Well, that's the spiritual life. You're walking on the tightrope in the middle of a cosmic battle. No wonder it's an intense experience that can be very disorienting. And so how does Jesus respond to this? Well, this is what I love. Jesus shows up and he gives him what he needs for the rest of the journey. And it's, it's interesting because somehow Jesus knows. It's, I don't know if word has gotten around. I don't know if a cry has come from his heart. But Jesus appears, and this is what he says to everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. In your unbelief, in your disorientation, in the chaos and uncertainty of your future, peace be with you. Thomas, it's real. I'm here. And then he says this. You wanted to see? See Here's my hands. Here's my side. And what's Thomas' response? He doesn't go, oh, fantastic. Now I can remain theologically inside the boundaries of new covenant theology. What's his response? It's awe. It's worship. It's a simple response. He says, my Lord and my God. He sees Jesus, the first one in the Gospel of John, to see Jesus for who who he really is. I want you to see this. He sees him on the other side of doubt, not before doubt. The revelation of you really are my God comes from wrestling through doubt, not a shallow acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah. He's the first person in the book to look at the person of Jesus and see that he is God directly. God, in his mercy, met him where he needed it in a way that made sense to him as a cry from his heart. And ultimately, I believe that that's what Jesus will do for you. May not be in your timing, may not be in your formula, may not be in the way that makes sense to your current moment, but I believe he'll do it. I'm amazed at the stories of how personal Jesus is to meet the doubts of people's hearts. What eases my doubts may trigger your doubts. What brought you to Jesus may push me away from Jesus. Faith is not a formula. It is an entrance into a relationship with a person who tends to our hearts, meets our needs, and meets us where we are. So what do we do? How, how do we see Jesus through doubt? How do we see Jesus through doubt? Well, here's my step number one. Let's, as I'm, to, I'm now, I've left Thomas. Thomas is in worship, Okay. He's in the upper room with the other disciples. He's worshiping. Now we're back here in New York, okay? What do we learn from Thomas? Number one, we've got to be honest with where we are. We've got to be honest with where we are. There's a a leadership concept Jim Collins talks about. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. And it's a story uh, about a soldier during the Vietnam War who was taken captive and he was put in a prisoner of war camp. And it's a story of survival through impossible odds, horrific conditions. And, they, it's, and it's been popularized with the idea of tragic optimism. And here's basically what it says. Naive people who think it's going to be fine and we're going to be rescued will die first. But the people who realize, they confront the brutal facts of reality. I am a prisoner of war. I may be here for six years. This will be hard. Without a long-determined goal, I am going to give in to despair. Therefore, I will have hope that I will be rescued, but it may take a decade. So they have a 10-year plan, not a 10-day plan, how to deal with the hardships they face. And so he said that they would see people, and sometimes the enemy would put false rumors amongst the prisoners of war that escape was coming soon, that liberation was coming soon. And they'd be like, we're going to be rescued by Christmas. And the ones who like, and everyone else is like, I think that's a rumor. I don't think that's true. They're like, no, no, we know for sure. And then those are the ones who died the week after Christmas. So I want to say this. You've got to be honest with what you wrestle with. Sometimes with churches that have a theology like ours, a charismatic theology, sometimes churches like ours that have expressive worship, by the way, I'll take expressive worship over non-expressive worship any day of the week. But I want to tell you, sometimes in those environments, we can forget that there's people who are like, I am struggling to believe any of this is real. 
And so we've got to have space. So I want to say, bring it into the middle. We talk about all of our problems in every kind of, you know, how's your marriage going? I'm struggling right now. I'm in a tough season right now. We're going to pray for you. We're going to work with you. We're going to get through this season. We start giving literature about how the worst marriages, if you stay in them for five years, 80% turn around, stick the, you know. But when it comes to our friends, oh, he's doubting. You know, like we freak out. Don't pollute the environment. Our faith is stronger than, than, than this. You're going to be okay. It may be painful, but it's rarely fatal. We're going to walk with you and we're going to get you through it. So we've got to be honest about this. We've got to have that tragic optimism. Yes, this is very hard. Yes, you may be in a situation like John the Baptist, but stay the course. Stay the course. Number two, we have to learn where we put our focus in times like this and in cultural environments like this. Our focus has to be on the person of Jesus. That's why in Hebrews 12 it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus so we don't, won't grow weary and lose heart. You can only focus on one thing at a time. You can focus on your problems. You can focus on the struggles. Or you can focus on the person of Jesus. You can interpret your problems and doubts in light of Jesus. Or you can interpret Jesus in light of your doubts and problems. One is relational. So we need to keep our eyes on him. I think of Peter walking on the water. An amazing moment. I'm assuming you're familiar with the story. Uh, here comes Jesus and he's walking on the water and Peter's like, Lord, if it's really you and I'm your disciple and you want me to do the Jesus stuff, I'm ready for walking on the water. Jesus is like, come to me. Peter's like, oh, heck yes. And he gets out of the boat and he's like, this is why I'm the rock. And he gets out and they're like, that's why you're the rock. You're sinking, homeboy. You are literally like, this is it. And he starts off by having his eyes on Jesus. And it says that when he saw the wind and the waves, he shifted his focus. And uh, it's, again, it's important to keep our eyes on Jesus. You're not denying there is a storm happening, but you're determining your reference point in the midst of the conditions. That's why it's so important to always read the Gospels. I'm a big believer, never, re- never leave the Gospels. Never leave the Gospels. If you're in a reading plan that does not include the Gospels, change your reading plan or supplement it so that you're getting Jesus every day. Now look, I'm a whole counsel of God. I'm not a red letter Christian. I'm like all scriptures God breathed. But Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, is the revelation of what God is like. And so we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Colossians 1 says that in all things he may have the supremacy. So we've got to get our eyes on Jesus. And I've got to tell you, you are probably living off what you remember about the Gospels rather than what the Gospels themselves say. So every day you need, it. You need comfort and confrontation with the person of Jesus through the Gospels. This past week I was, I was reading a little passage from the Gospels, just reading it slowly and meditating and I, I had to put my Bible down, my iPad Bible down. And I was like walking around dumbfounded like, whoa, whoa. I've been a pastor 25 years. I've preached this passage. How did I miss this? And this opened up a portal into worship and communion and struggle and pouring out my heart with God. And all the verse said was he left Nazareth and went and lived in Capernaum. How many of you are like, oh my goodness, that's a touchstone in a glory. (laughs) the, the, The page opened and I fell into the kingdom of God. It was an extraordinary account just showing me who Jesus is and what he's like. And I say that you've got to get your focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Next, you need community. Faith is individual, yes, and it must be expressed individually, but it's a communal endeavor. It's belonging to the community of faith. When we did the baptisms last week, what did we say the week before? We welcome you into the household of faith. Faith is a family affair. We need to remember we're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, and we need to remember what it says in the book of Hebrews. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So this is a heavy passage, but what does it say? But encourage one another daily. Some of you, some of us live in a world that is so tempting and so hostile to what it is that we believe. 
that we need people every day to say, you're not crazy, this stuff is real, sin's not worth it, stay the course, I love you, I'll forgive you if you sin, don't sin, I love you. We need people saying that to us daily, putting courage in us to live the life of faith. The Bible has no concept or category for a person who floats around and does not belong in a Christian community. It literally is a theological impossibility in God's Word. And so you are asking for a future of doubt if you isolate yourself from the people of God. Nobody's faith is that strong. So we need to be in community, loving one another and stirring one another up. And then last thing I want to say is this. Your destiny is not a destiny of doubt. It's a destiny of faith. Because your faith doesn't depend on the strength of your belief, but on the mercy and grace of God. And we can sometimes think, my faith is strong if I feel like it's strong. No, your faith is strong if Jesus is holding you. There's a difference. God's grace is sufficient for you if you've trusted in Him, whether you feel like it or not. The question is whether or not you're in the wheelbarrow or not. That's the, that's the, and if you're in it, it doesn't matter how you're feeling. You're living the life of faith. And it's important that we put our trust in the work of Christ and not our own sense of self-assuredness. One of the things the Gospels repeatedly do is take people who think they've got it all together and embarrass them in the pages of Scripture till they come to a point of humility where they truly say it's actually all about you not my own willpower. And so we can be confident in our humility that God will be with us. Thomas, the doubter. Thomas, the doubter. There's a very, very good chance that many of you are going to meet Thomas one day. And can I just say to you, don't go up to me like, Thomas, quite a little encounter there, my doubting friend. Thomas the doubter. It's almost unfair. It's almost unfair because this is one scene of his life, but it's not Thomas's destiny. Do you know what happens to Thomas? According to church tradition, Thomas is one of the apostles who hears Jesus and he goes into all the world and preaches the gospel. And Thomas goes to India and Thomas is the first and only apostle to go outside of the Roman Empire. And he brought the kingdom of God to a part of India where today I have a friend who's a pastor from India and his name is Thomas. And there's, whole, the, the whole, there's whole, a whole area where people are called Thomas or their last name is Thomas because of the faith of this man. So here's the truth. Thomas is not a doubter. Thomas doubted. That's not his permanent reality. He was faithful. He was a missionary. He was a believer. He was an apostle. He was a martyr. Thomas was an overcomer. Thomas was a disciple. Thomas's destiny wasn't doubt, it was faith. And given enough of a timeline, that would have happened. We would have seen it. And so I just want to say to you today, regardless of where you are, I just want you to know your destiny is not doubt and failure. Your destiny is the faithfulness of God in your life. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will carry it out until the day of completion. may not feel like it. it. may be dark. There may be a struggle. You may be in one of those eclipses I talked about a couple of weeks ago, but I want you to know you are not forgotten. God loves you. This is not the end of your story, and He will come through. So I want us to respond today. Maybe you can bow your head and just open up your heart to God, and maybe we can just invite Him into wherever we are. Maybe you're here today, and you've just freshly been filled with the Holy Spirit and your inner life is a life of spring and it's just everything's bursting to life and if you're in that position can you just say Lord thank you thank you for this season that I'm in what a gift what a joy for that season maybe you're in a winter maybe you're just like oh my gosh man this is just hard maybe you're struggling to question whether or not it's worth it Maybe you feel that temptation to shrink back or to ease off. Why don't you just give that over to God? Invite God into that. Maybe there's something that you're really wrestling with and you want to just say, Lord, I need you to fill in the blank. I need you to resolve this issue. I need you to still 
this anxiety. I need you to calm this thing in my heart. I need your mercy, Lord. Please come in. It says at the end of this chapter, these things were written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's God's heart for you. Faith, real faith, deep faith, true faith. Life, real life, true life, deep life. In the name of Jesus. So Father, we come into your presence right now. We open our hearts to you. We just ask that you would meet us here today. Lord, I pray for some folks, this would be an upper room experience where your peace comes in in a supernatural, transcendent way and just changes the whole culture of their heart and life. Lord, for those who are in a place of pain and they're just wrestling deeply with your goodness, I just want to ask, I pray for the mercy and comfort of God. Holy Spirit, would you bring comfort to those places of hurt and disappointment? And Jesus, I just pray that you would give us, make us as a church community, as a church family, people who fix our eyes on you. I pray that we will trust in you and not our circumstances. Lord, I pray that you would give us grace to walk on the water of our lives, Lord, even a few steps. Lord, we just resolve that if you ask us, we'll get out of the boat, we'll get in the wheelchair. Even if it's crazy, even if it's overwhelming, Lord Jesus, we say you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? And so we offer the prayer of the man in Mark chapter 9 collectively today, Lord. We say, we believe, help our unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus, strengthen our faith by your mercy and your kindness. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to continue our responding in worship. We've got some trained prayer counselors. They're going to come forward. They're going to be around the the outside of the room. If you need prayer for anything at all today, maybe this is one of those days and you just need encouragement today. You need encouragement and you just want someone to pray over you or pray for you. I'd encourage you to come forward. It's a safe space. Maybe you're sitting there and um, there's there's some answer you need and you're wrestling with it and you want someone just to pray for you. Maybe your seed of faith today might be tiny. It's just to literally come forward in obedience and say, God, please, I believe, help my unbelief. And you just want to put that forward before God. I want to encourage you, whatever the Holy Spirit is saying in your heart, whatever you've heard from God's Word that's moved you, let's respond and believe together that God will address our doubts and increase our faith. Amen.